Luke 16, really the whole chapter is a call to shrewdness, uh, creativity, and um, benevolence. with our resources and it is all angled towards eternal salvation. Let's read the first several verses here of the chapter, a parable of Jesus. There was a rich man who had a manager and charges were brought to him that this man was wasting his possessions and he called him and said to him, what is this that I hear about you? Turn in the account of your manager or management, for you can no longer be manager. And the manager said to himself, What shall I do, since my master's taking the management away from me? I'm not strong enough to dig, and I'm ashamed to beg. I've decided what to do, so that when I'm removed from my management, people may receive me into their houses. So summoning, summoning his master's debtors one by one, he said to the first, How much do you owe my master? He said, a hundred measures of oil. He said to him, Take your bill and sit down quickly and write fifty. Then he said to another, And how much do you owe? He said, A hundred measures of wheat. He said to him, Take your bill and write eighty. The master commended the dishonest manager for his shrewdness, for the sons of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than the sons of light. And I tell you, make friends for yourselves by means of unrighteous wealth, so that when it fails, they may receive you into the eternal dwellings. So let's zoom in on verses 8 and 9, because this is the heart of the matter. Jesus initiates the challenge here. Jesus provides reason for the parable. And after these verses, 10 and following, Jesus gives a couple of motivators as Christians to listen to what he said. So, the master commended the dishonest manager for shrewdness. That's, that's really the, the punchline of the parable, is that the master commi commended this manager for his shrewdness. And... Keep in mind, because I think sometimes we we would we would just nest, we would automatically say, well, this master is paralleled to God, and therefore God is giving a commendation for dishonesty. Or uh, actually, the word here in Greek is unrighteous. So so God is commending unrighteousness. No, there are parallels to this master and God. But keep in mind, Jesus is saying that this master as well as this manager are what he would call sons of this world. They are over against the sons of light. So we're talking about a worldly master and a worldly manager and the way that those two relate to one another. There are some parallels but it is not equivalent to God and his dealings with his people. Now, the master's commending the dishonest manager for his shrewdness. Now, Jesus, as he sees all this playing out, as he sees this manager using possessions that are not his, taking bills of a hundred and making them fifty and taking bills of a hundred measures of weed and making them 80. It's a continual squandering and wasting of the rich man's things. As Jesus sees all of that taking place, this is his commentary on it as the Son of God, the Master of the Universe. Verse 8. For the sons of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than the sons of light. So as, as Jesus sees this master giving commendation to a manager who was unrighteous and dishonest, 
though very shrewd and there's commendation that's happening because of it. Jesus says, the sons of this world, that is, anybody that is not a Christian, they are better at making a dollar than sons of this world are at doing things that actually matter. Sons of this world are better at dealing with other people than children of God are at bringing souls to salvation. And so Jesus initiates this challenge, and uh, I'll just say that should prick all this as Jesus sees it. He says, you watch all this, you watch accommodation from a master for dishonesty from his manager, though very shrewd. And here's this guy making friends for himself by shrewdness. He says, sons of this world are, are better at dealing with people than, than God's people are. That, that's not intended to be a good thing. He isn't saying it should be like that or that it should stay like that. Because he goes on and he says, he gives this challenge. He says, I tell you, so here's Jesus, your master, if you're a Christian. I tell you, and here's the imperative. Make friends. Make friends the same way that this dishonest manager through shrewdness made friends for himself who would receive him into their houses. So Jesus is saying, you, disciple, make friends for yourselves by means of unrighteous wealth. What does that mean? Don't go far from the parable. Don't go searching somewhere else for what unrighteous wealth means. In the parable, you had a manager who was using somebody else's possessions for his benefit. So they belonged to the rich man and the manager was using the rich man's possessions. So that is unrighteous wealth. It is possessions that belong to the manager, or excuse me, that belong to the rich man being used by the manager. They are possessions belonging to the manager in terms of a hundred measures of oil and 50 of them went astray because he changed the bill. They are a hundred measures of wheat that belong to the, to the rich man. I keep switching the rich man and, and manager that wrong, belong to the rich man and the manager says it's actually 80. That's unrighteous wealth. It is wealth that is in the possession of somebody though it doesn't belong to them. So, if Jesus is telling disciples to make friends by means of what he calls unrighteous wealth, uh, I believe it's Psalm 150. That may not be the right psalm, but you can look into it. God says, If I were in need, I would not tell you, for the earth is mine and all of its fullness. So, wealth that would be... Uh, in the possession of a son of this world, or excuse me, excuse me, in the son of light, wealth that would be in the possession of a son of light that Jesus would call unrighteous because it belongs to somebody else, then the implication is that it belongs to God because all things in the whole universe are God's. And so therefore God is saying, or Jesus is saying, use the possessions in your hands which are actually God's, use them shrewdly, use them in such a way that your master would give commendation because you were making friends for yourselves with it, but you're not making friends for yourselves in the way that this manager was. He was doing it totally out of selfishness. Now, he was good at it, but Jesus says, here's what you're really after. So that when it fails, when 
the unrighteous wealth fails, and it will fail. It's just a matter of when that happens. They, who, the friends that you've made, they may receive you into the eternal dwellings. What does that mean? Well, the word dwellings there, and it actually doesn't, I don't think that the word needs to be illuminated in the Greek just to make sense of it because you have the word eternal there. So we're talking about not this earth. We're talking about heaven. But that word dwellings there means tabernacle or tent just to put a a religious flair on it. Uh, Use the resources you have right now so that when all things fail, you will have gained some people in this world to Christ because they saw you being very shrewd with that which belonged to somebody else. And you were using it to make friends for yourselves because you wanted them to be in the eternal dwellings. And when they pass on, when you get to the end of this life, Lord willing, they will be receiving you into heaven with gladness. Now, Jesus gives a couple further reasons. He says, one who is faithful in a very little is also faithful in much. And one who is dishonest in a very little is also dishonest in much. So what does he mean by a very little? Let verse 11 illuminate it. If then you have not been faithful, see, um, in, if you've not been faithful in the unrighteous wealth, meaning money that is in your possession that belongs to God. It is a very little thing. Who will entrust to you the true riches? And this word here is not, the word riches is not actually there. It actually just says that which is true. Who will entrust to you that which is true? So if you use a a small thing, like wealth, faithfully, then you're going to be faithful in a big thing, in a thing, that which is true. And if you've been dishonest, or this word is actually unrighteous, if you've been unrighteous in something that's very small, like unrighteous wealth, then you will also be unrighteous in much, in that which is true. You will not handle the truth properly, if you do not use something as simple as money properly. So verse 11 means if you are not using God's resources to, as he put it, make friends for yourselves for the purpose of eternal salvation, and the world is seeing you with this unrighteous wealth, it's God's money in your possession, but you're not using it for anybody but yourself, then why would anybody entrust to you uh, the, the concession of the point that you know the truth? Why would anybody say, well, yeah, this guy doesn't feed me. He doesn't care about me. He doesn't give me clothing when I'm naked. He doesn't give me shelter when I'm cold and it's raining. He doesn't give me a ride when I'm on the side of the road. He doesn't do anything for me. But sure, I'll, I'll, I'll entrust my soul to him. Why would anybody do that? Well, you'll never never make any friends if you live that way. And then in verse 12, and if you've not been faithful in that which is another's, which is what? Again, this points back to unrighteous wealth. It's not yours. It belongs to God. That's unrighteous wealth. That's a good connection to show what is unrighteous wealth. Well, it's wealth that you have that belongs to another person. If you've not been faithful in that which is another's, who will give you that which is your own? So, God owns this wealth. God owns it. And if you've not been faithful in the thing that belongs to God, then who will give you that which is your own? What is your own? How about your soul? It's he's, Money is not your own. Your house is not your own. Your car is not your own. Your body is not your own. For you were bought with a price. So who will give you that which is your own? In other words, so a person won't give you the trust of their salvation if you don't show them love by the things that you have. 
And God will not give you eternal salvation if you don't show him that you're trustworthy in the thing that actually belongs to him. Because he goes on and he says, No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. So the challenge is make friends by means of wealth that belongs to God so that they may be in heaven and receive you into heaven, so that they may entrust to you that which is true. They believe you. They believe that you have the truth. And so that God will give to you that which is your own.